Hey everyone, welcome back. It's what, like a day later, a week later? I don't know when I release this video, but it's actually only half a drink later. We've got many more pages to get through, so Q&A continuing. Caesar Not Rex. Caesar Not Rex says, what are some funny or interesting examples of bad questions you have received? So, I love that you have opened the door for me to explain more something I have mentioned in the past. And most of you are very respectful of it, and I appreciate that fact. Superlative questions. I am stealing this idea, prob I think it's CGP Grey is where I first heard it, and I was like, yes, oh my god, that encapsulates perfectly uh, a brilliant rule. And I encourage my other YouTube friends who do Q&As to, to do this, but they don't. I mean, Carl and Ian both get inundated with these kind of freaking questions. So, so what are superlative questions? What I mean is, what's the greatest? Who's the best? What's your favorite? What do you like the worst? I mean, you can, if you watch In Range, Forgotten Weapons, like, you know, you know those questions. What's the best light machine gun ever made? Or what's your favorite pistol? And you see, like, I just watch their, their spirits are like, ugh, this freaking question. All right. You know, I mean, they're, they're sports about it uh, in a way that I am not, clearly. But as I was telling, uh, I was actually told Carl this recently. We were just together at the, in Florida. Superlative questions are the packing peanuts of a Q&A. Here's what I mean by that. Packing peanuts. If you have to ship something to someone, if I'm going to ship this ship's decanter to somebody else, right? I put it in a box and I've got to pat it because I wanted to break it. It's a nice leaded crystal from Ireland. I could do a number of things, right? I could use that like big bubble pack. I could use foam. I could custom cut like blocks uh, with a laser cutter or something like, you know, or I could use packing peanuts. Right? You wrap it once or twice in bubble wrap and then packing peanuts, just dump a -roo right in the box. Packing peanuts are super easy on the sender, but they are shoveling like all of the effort on the recipient. It makes the recipient's job hard and you see none of that. You experience none of those like costs of effort. Superlative questions are that. They're the, among the easiest questions you can ask. You can just fire off a superlative question. What's your favorite uh, lockpick? It doesn't take you any effort, but me, it's either the most boring question ever, where I'm like, quad work, done. Like, it, it doesn't give you much of an answer. It doesn't give my audience much of an answer. Or it's a really crazy, like, well, it can't just be one, and here's why. And it, you get to this long thing, and it's still not a very rewarding answer. Except that movie one. I like that one. Thank you. Was it Mike who sent that one in? Um, yeah, like superlative questions are the ones that I don't like. Um, so those are, what, what are some funny or interesting examples of bad questions? Those. It's always superlatives. So if you're thinking, and I want to just give you something here, right? Like if you're going to say, what's the funniest uh, job story you, you ever had? And I think that's in here. So I, I kind of mentioned somebody about that. I, I don't call you out. If you ask a superlative, I will politely ask you to rephrase it, and I'll only identify you by your initials. But you could instead say, have you ever done a job in which something, something, something specific? Or what if you were approaching a situation in which something, something, something specific? And the specific should come from you. It should be a part of your life. Your, your question, this is another thing about superlatives, they don't really tell me anything about you. It's not interesting for me because I can't imagine a fully formed, developed person asking me. I, I love, someone could say, I live in rural Mississippi and we have this one chain of stores and they all use this lock and here's a photo of it. And I like throw it up on the screen and if I remember to edit shit right. And I'd be like, oh, I can imagine where you live. This lock does this. Is this the conditions and the environmental? And, and I can like speak to that because I feel like I'm speaking to a real person. Uh, superlatives don't make you into a real person. They don't make me into much of an interesting person in my answers. Uh, 
Alexander R., uh, who is someone I think I may have met on one of my trips to Norway, by the way, if I was fortunate enough to meet you. That's fucking awesome. If I saw correctly, Alexander says, there were actual liver strong bracelets uh, looking much like, you know, live strong bracelets. How would I go about getting one of those? So yes, there are absolutely uh, liver strong bracelets. And those bracelets were made by my good friend, Jack Daniel. Uh, not my good friend, Jack Daniels, who is not my best friend, frankly. Uh, my best friends are Basil Haydens and Woodford and Larceny. Uh, Tara likes Jack Daniels. But no, Jack Daniel, the person, the human being, um, there's a hacker named Jack Daniel. Uh, he's a, a mainstay in the hacker community. He's been around a very long time. He is a cocktail maker, a tiki bar aficionado. He is a, just a marvelous, marvelous human being in every way, shape, or form. Uh, he made a run of them, and they were going to be, he was going to give them out when we first gave the talk, Liver Strong. Uh, he was planning to be there with me giving this talk about uh, liquor hacking. It's on the channel. I'll link it down in the WhatsApp. Uh, but he, last minute, he couldn't make it to North Carolina, so I gave the talk by myself, but he shipped the bracelets, and I flung them out into the audience. Uh, there were probably, like, two bracelets for every person there, so I don't know. Maybe they'll pop up on eBay. The, if anyone has a spare liver strong... You know what? I'll tell you what, Alexander, that is the last liver strong bracelet that I personally have. I grabbed it off the bar, where it uh, kind of sits wrapped around... So it's stretched, stretched out. We actually... We have this little jar of nuts on the bar. We have a little jar of filberts, and it didn't have a gasket, this old wooden thing. But I will find, I will make my own gasket for that little jar on the bar, and I will ship you that. Uh, get in touch. I will, I will email you back. We'll get a Norway address out of you. I'll put it in an envelope. But for everyone else out there, find out uh, from your friends who went to North Carolina at the Carolina Con and, and saw my talk. Maybe, maybe they got one. So, Jack Daniels, the creator of the Liver Strong Bracelets, when is the last time you think you made those? A long time ago. A long time ago. Long time ago. The, the beard was like here when he made, when he made those. Right, right. So, check eBay. Yeah, that's it. Right check on. eBay. Brian K. says, I've been involved in Nerf blaster modification for the last decade or so. Freaking so based right there. Awesome shit. I am so based in Nerf build. Just listening to this question. I grew up like shooting Nerf darts around places I probably shouldn't and almost got in trouble. Replacing electronics, which wow, Nerf guns have gotten involved, and upgrading springs and such in plunger based systems, which I have heard of. I've heard of this phenomenon. It's really cool. I learned about it from Modern Rogue. They did an episode on making your Nerf guns uh, more violent and dangerous and, and look cooler. There, there, it's, there was like theater prop effects. Oh, it was very good. I'll, again, I'll, if I can find that episode, I should drop it below. Uh, he said, after getting involved in your community and line of work, a question popped in my head, and I'd love your opinion, on is my hobby a form of hacking? And are the skills uh, useful and practical outside of this hobby? Uh, so, yes. Uh, first of all, hell yes. Um, nobody owns the word hacking just because they have, like, a keyboard or some bullshit like that. Um, hacking, at its core, is doing something that wasn't expected. Uh, and I think the broader definition is loving and getting deep into the little crenellations of knowledge in a, any given system so much, is loving it so much and getting into the weeds so much that you can make things happen that the original designers did not intend to have happen. And what you're doing, what you're describing, absolutely, absolutely it's hacking and absolutely it's applicable because it's unconventional thinking. And you could think this is nuts. I would say having a little portfolio of projects you've done, get some really nice photos of them, talk about being able to speak to that, that goes as a little addendum, a little appendix to your technical resume. And you can say to people, like, this is what I've done. This is, like, I did this hack. Like, that's freaking great. That's so cool. If you 3D printed parts or if you wrote code or did anything, you jumpered out the electronics, have those stories. Those are interesting stories. You tell those stories to an interview, to a hiring manager. That's awesome. I would, lo I love that kind of stuff. Yes, you're absolutely a hacker. Don't let anyone tell you you're not. 
Sisyphus. Sisyphus says, I ran into this item. And uh, it, he dropped a link, and I will. you're seeing it on the screen right now. Uh, is it snake oil? Is it too good to be true? It seems ridiculous. <laughs> Uh, and it is the Deeper Connect Nano Decentralized VPN Cybersecurity Hardware. Um, I don't, so full disclosure, I don't know that exact product, uh, so much so that I asked my friends in a, a few Slack channels. I was like, hey, anyone heard of this freaking thing? Uh, I do know that there is a history of people on Kickstarter and other places trying to sell similar products for way too much money. At the end of the day, uh, this is way too much money, right? Like this is, th what, $300 almost for, as my friend Guy said, what could basically be done by a Raspberry Pi running PFSense, like running, you know, and, uh, and you get a VPN subscription to some cheapo VPN, like who cares? At, the, at this price, especially if there's no knock-on subscription fee, you're probably not getting a good VPN. You're not getting really good privacy, right? You're, you're getting tunneling, so maybe your local ISP doesn't know what kind of porn you like, but I wouldn't trust it, you know, as far as I could throw it. And it looks like a tiny ass freaking box. I could probably throw it far. There's a good chance that they're literally using a Raz Pi or something similar, something lightweight. Um, most of these products, I like, like, sure, they're going to do what they advertise. They will tunnel your stuff through a VPN, semi-reliably maybe. And if it's sitting on your network, like in between you and the router, and if they architect the software on the box and the firmware that says, don't pass traffic off the VPN, if the VPN is not available, like, don't do it, I guess that works. It's not great, probably. Um, but is it, you know, if somebody doesn't write code, doesn't want to manage, like, learn how to do IP tables or PFSense or anything like that, sure. That's a turnkey solution. Maybe it works. I don't know. I would love if anyone in the comments wants to respond to Sisyphus and say they've seen this exact product. <laughs> I'll, I'll link it down yonder. Uh, you can tell us if it's a pile of dog shit, but only comment if you've actually tried it. Don't be that Amazon reviewer that's like, I haven't bought the product, but it looks bad. What, what are you fucking doing? All right, Bram. Bram R. Bram R. was wondering whether I've done jobs in Europe, and if so, what's different from the USA? Can you tell us your favorite story from abroad? Uh, that's a superlative question. So, I don't have a favorite story, and even if I did, it's a superlative question. But no, I, yes, we've worked in Europe. Not as much as Asia, uh, Asia and the Middle East, but yeah, Europe, um, in general, the doors are better. The doors are more secure. The hardware is more secure. Everything is a cut above in Europe. And we speak to this in, well, a class that the core, but before, even before Red Team Alliance, the core group used to run the class, uh, Physical Security Analyst. And we talk about site security. We have, we have a, a similar class now, a security design concepts class, where we get into the fact that countries that have a history of occupation have a stronger security culture, like baked into the architecture of the buildings. In America, the idea of, oh, I am at risk of something, you might, depending on your situation, defined as your skin color, you might turn to the state and ask for help. You might ask the authorities, hey, I have a stalker, I have a this, I got this problem. In Europe, it was the authorities who were the ones who were trying to come into your home. I mean, there's people alive right now still to this day in Europe, who remember when the state was like occupied government. And the idea that they could just burst in um, is very, very true in their hearts and their minds. So that's why door and construction, like building design and door construction is what it is in Europe. If you go over there, the doors are much more robust. Uh, it is, it's just a different world over there. It's a lot harder to do bypassing, I'll tell you that. Uh, lock picking is no cakewalk either, so we rely on other things. We rely on a lot of electronic attacks when we're in Europe, frankly. Uh, you see a lot of MyFair. NXP has a much bigger market presence, so you can see more. A um, lot of MyFair, a lot of, yeah, sometimes Desfire, but thankfully, yeah, electronic attacks will get us in. 
even push to exit, you're not going to see, you know, gassing the rec sensor because they have push to exit in Europe much more than they do here. It's, it's a different security culture. Adam M asks, how do you get good clean cuts with the leashy nippers and those spacers that you sell on Red Team Tools? So Adam is uh, referring, I presume, to the, we're calling it like the field expedient pack-a-punch, uh, which at some point someone's going to remake the pack-a-punch, right? That's why we're trying to just keep these in stock. It, we're going to sell them when we can sell them, and one day somebody's going to come up with something better. I hope it's one of you. Keep thinking. But Adam says, I can't quite seem to get it right. I'm trying to get the keys. They're not, they're not quite lining, you know, the hit or miss. Uh, I've had this as well. Other people have talked about it. Broadly, Rubber Band's review was really good on our little 3D printed cutter guides. Uh, Rubber Band and others have said, broadly, they work, right? They, they're not as good as the original Pack-A-Punch. It's a shame that A1 is gone. But what I do is I try to use, like Mr. Moneybags here with those expensive blanks, I use SC20 or SC19 keys. I use L blank Schlage keys because my uh, the cutter guides are for Schlage. So the thinner a key is, the easier the nip will happen and you're less likely to deform and bend the metal. I don't want to get into my old mechanical engineering days of like what shearing forces do and how you can tell which forces are applied to metal when it breaks and yields. But ultimately, if you use thinner keys, now mind you, SC20 keys and SC19s, the L blanks are sometimes made of steel. I don't recommend you cut steel with the leashy pliers. You might do it, you're probably going to deform the nipper and the anvil. Don't do that. But if you can get brass ones, yes, it's less of a, an effort and it's a cleaner cut. Try that. Or if that's not working, email me. Like again, I try to respond to everybody who reaches out to Red Team Tools and elsewhere. Uh, I'll work with you. We'll figure it out. So another leashy cutter question from Downward Machine, also a cool name. Regarding those cutter templates, are there any plans to create templates for more key types? Might the 3D printing files be released? Uh, so yes, I did put them on my GitHub. Uh, that's linked in like all of the places and all these, all my videos, my GitHub's up there. It's GitHub slash DeviantOlaf, spelled not like it sounds, like every other of my links. So the, the templates for Schlage are up there. Are we going to do others? Yes. Uh, we have been actively trying to work on Quickset, which is going to be easier because Quickset, the tolerances are sloppier, the, the differs are bigger. They'll be up there. We're just, we're freaking underwater. We're all, like, everybody is so goddamn busy. Um, it's all that Tony can do to keep the Schlage ones in stock. But I promise they're coming. And when they happen, like, we'll put the Quickset ones out. Why not? Again, my whole shtick is if you want to make it yourself and your printer is like super zeroed and dialed in, Go to fucking town. I don't care. Uh, or if you don't want to spend that time, you don't have a 3D printer, like buy it from us. It, whatever. Do what you want to do. But this was the interesting question. Downward said, might it be possible to create a universal key template system? And I, I took some notes. I did some scratching here. I said, well, that's maybe, but it's impractical. Or do you mean like just having a deck of cutters so that no matter what key you needed to do, you would like have a cutter guide? So... Let's say a keyblade, a typical keyblade is like a centimeter. And conservatively, if half of that distance, so five millimeters is like cutting space, and the differs between cut depths, most brands of lock you're going to talk, if we're keeping with metric, right, it's like a third of a millimeter, a third, a fourth of a millimeter, or four, four tenths of a millimeter, a th three tenths of, you know. So that's, eh. What, like 15, 16? I'm, I'm doing math in my head at this point. I didn't write this part down. Uh, 15 or 16 possible cut depths. You could have one of, like, our little guides. They come in a box. You could have a box with, like, 16 doozles in it. Now, here's where it gets funny. The reason our Schlage ones work as well as they do, and they don't work perfectly, they have warding built in, right? Like they have guides so that the Schlage warding comes in so the Schlage key will seat and hold. You'd have to throw all that out if you're making universal ones. I assume you, you mean like for any brand of key. So no warding. So you have to really make sure you're holding it flat and straight. 
This isn't even getting into the fact that some keys are thicker than others. So are we leaving slop space there? I don't know. Could you, could you do it? Like, yes, it could be practical. I don't know if it's worthwhile because it would cost a lot of money, so much money that I think anyone who would buy it at that price would probably just be buying like a Blitz machine or a, an HPC punch or something. I, I realize we're not talking hundreds of dollars versus a thousand dollars. It actually got me thinking. I'll tell you what, if, if you want to take the designs we put up, modify them to make a big enough set that you think it's universal, put it out there. Like, put it on thing, put it, you know, with a license. All my shit is Creative Commons. It's all share alike, non-commercial. If you put the license non-commercial so no one can take this idea and try to turn it around in China and make a bunch of money selling it to people, yes, have at it. SS, your name is fully redacted because your question is, I recently ordered a 3D printer. Do you have any ideas for cool or useful things to print? Well, SS, I redacted your name because my first answer is guns. <laughs> and I don't want, I don't know if you have a dog, but I don't want the government to kill your dog. Uh, but no, honestly, uh, so Thingiverse. Thingiverse is a great place to start. A bunch of, a bunch of great stuff is there. Don't spend too much time just printing clutter. Printing like, oh, I made this thing, it's a, it's a cat bird, and it's on my shelf. You do that for the first week. You do that till you get your printer really dialed in. But then print practical stuff. Print holders, print organize. I'm like Johnny organized, right? So like print things that make your life better. Uh, print ways to make your spice rack more organized or, or your, I don't, I, I don't know what you want to print, but like print stuff that makes your life cooler. And if you don't have an idea of what you're making your life better, ask your friends and neighbors. Be on the lookout for things that can make their lives easier. And they're going to be 20, 30 minute prints. You're like, oh, you know, you, you had this, uh, your, your bookcase is a, you know, a little bit, this one book is always falling over. I printed you a little uh, bookend thing. There you go. Do shit like that. Rav. Rav says, what is a skill set lacking in most physical pen test teams or operations? What causes these blind spots? So I'm going to defer to my good friend, Chris Nickerson, who talked about red teaming. And I, I borrowed from this sort of model. I mentioned him in my talk, you're probably not red teaming. Uh, there are three facets to security. There are three surfaces of security. There's physical security, which we might call mechanical security. There's digital security, and then there's human security. There's the social element, right? So most practitioners and most jobs and most teams are made up of people who are good at some, but not all of those surfaces. Someone's really amazing at, you know, the ones and zeros hacking, but maybe they don't pick locks or bypass doors. Someone's an amazing social engineer, but they can't clone an RFID credential. Maybe someone's a stellar lock picker, but the idea of like how to pop a shell, if they can get up to a machine and, and like, oh, this is on the network, even if they could drop it like a console cable into a router, like digital, not on their thing. So people often have blind spots on one of, or two of those surfaces, even if they're good at another. Uh, and what's the answer is cross-training. Cross-training yourself and getting a diverse, broad team. Uh, if you, if you, what is it? you know, Kusanagi said, if you, if you specialize in everything, you breed weakness into your team, right? Major Kusanagi said it long time ago, long before a Japanese character was played by a white woman. Ethan E. says, hey, Deviant, I hope you are well. Thank you. I hope you are well as well. I have two questions that I hope aren't superlatives. Good job. One, has your more recent fame or internet following and influence led to you being recognized more in the street? Uh, yes, not so much the street, but especially in airports and at other events. Uh, it's really crazy because I don't ever expect anyone to know who I am. Have you been recognized on a job yet? 
No, thankfully. Uh, my buddy has, Bobak has, but the best story I have there, and I think maybe I've told this once uh, somewhere else, Tara was giving a presentation at a company and she was, you know, she was like their lunch speaker or something. Um, and we were at, is a tech firm, right? So we were invited in, we get there at 10 30, 11 o'clock and they bring us to the break room and hang out and whatever, whatever. And she's getting set up because she's a very professional speaker and she has her, she has her act so together. And I'm just wandering around. I got nothing to do. I'm in the break room. I'm, you know, it's the employee snack area. And I'm getting like a cup of nuts and a, a free drink from the whatever. And a couple of people walk by this, they, they turn around and they go, Deviant, are, are we being broken into right now? Is this a test? And I wanted to fuck with them so badly. <laughs> I was like, no, 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 no. Um, Tara's, Tara's your lunch speaker. This It's the Friday lunch session. And they're like, oh, cool, cool, cool. But if you're just lying and if this really is a test, just, we caught you. you. You get it? All right, pound it out. Okay, so cool. So yeah, that was that's the, the one time that's actually happened. Um, and Ethan says, they, la they asked this in the last Q&A, but want to follow up. Oh, yes. Yeah, so yeah, I love this. This is cool. I thought this wasn't going to be a thing, and it totally was a thing. What are your channel metrics like now that you're a larger channel? Um, well, so first of all, the fact that I look at my metrics more is true. I never used to care when I would put up a video. I would just let it fly and who gives a shit? And that's actually why the channel got more serious. Tara and some other people, mostly Tara, looked at my channel once and they were like, um, do you realize you have like 50,000 followers on YouTube? You have way more than you have on Twitter. And I was like, you're fucking shitting me. And I looked and I was like, wow, that's neat. Uh, so now I actually check how videos are doing and I try to tailor some things. I don't do the thing. Well, I, I mentioned I was going to tell you about this, right? If you've ever, do you ever have YouTube channels that you really love and you follow them religiously and they put up a video and you're like one of the first people who watches, maybe other people like comments first, but then later in the day or the next day, you're like, oh, so-and-so has a new video. Oh, I've seen this video. It looks different now because the thumbnail is different and the title has changed. I hate that shit. Um, that's a, an algorithm game that the really, we're talking like big, big mega channels, the diamonds have to do now. To play the algorithm game, they have like multiple thumbnails in reserve, like a quiver of arrows. And in the first hours of their video being up, they will flip through thumbnails rapidly and they'll change the video title sometimes. And they watch their video analytics get a bump. And when whichever one of them, it's like fishing. And if one of them catches fire, they're like, oh cool, go with that. That's the video, for whatever reason, the algorithm has blessed this video now and it's getting shared everywhere. Uh, so I don't do that crap. But I am amazed at other things that I, had, I haven't checked since you asked, Ethan. Um, channels in terms of countries. Germany. Germany has overtaken Australia. For the most part, most of my viewership is American, or like if they're not American, they're people who speak English. They're Commonwealth countries. So the UK, Canada, uh, you know, we used to have a lot of Scandinavian viewers, but Australia was always up there. Uh, Germany, I don't know, Australia, you gotta, you gotta start doing them clicks more. Am I doing the wrong time zone or something for you? You're all asleep. But yeah, uh, Scandawija, still very up in the mix. Other parts of the world. I love it. I love that the fact that I'm not just talking about American crap to Americans. Likewise, gender is moving. Uh, over 5% of this channel's audience is now designated by YouTube as female. And 1% we've got user specified. Uh, I don't know if that means NB or gender nonconforming or something. Uh, but either way, super badass. Uh, the audience is also slightly older now. The 25 to 35 group is almost matched by the 35 to 45 group. I don't know if we're all just aging together. Uh, even the old folks are seeing a slight bump. So uh, that's why I'm trying to make sure my audio is normalized and you can still hear me because <laughs> we're all getting up there in age. But that, yeah, Ethan says, keep doing what you do. I respect you and I hope to run into you someday. Uh, I hope to run into you someday as well. That'll be awesome. Thank you, Ethan. Glad you're still here. 
I don't know where we are on the timeline, but I feel, if my judgment's not too impaired, that we're pushing that time limit. So let's chop it. Let's 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 keep this one going. I've got more pages to go, but we're gonna we're gonna turn this into another video. All right, catch in a little bit. Stay safe out there.